Ever since there were people in Ireland, there were tales of the She, a race of magical creatures, shadow dwellers, little people, the crafty leprechaun with his crock of gold, the mermaid who lured sailors to a watery grave, and the banshee with her unearthly cry. We have all heard these old yarns, and of course, that's all they are. Fairy tales, make-believe, innocent bedtime stories and childish superstitions. In this day and age, nobody could possibly believe them. So we rest assured, knowing we are too sophisticated to be taken in. But bear one thing in mind. According to legend, the victims of these creatures are always non-believers. And as the old saying goes, those who think they are wisest always make the best fools. The leprechaun's a very tricky wee boy. And the one thing is you should never take your eyes off him, because he'll trick you if he can. There was a young fellow called Michael O'Grady one time, walking through the fields, and he heard the tap, 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 tap. And he knew what that was. He was sure it was a leprechaun. And Michael sneaked up behind him, reached out his hand, just grabbed him round the leg. Let me go, let me go! I'm not letting you go. I want to see your pot of gold. So away they went, down through the woods, until they came to a lovely thick clump of trees. That's where it is there, says the leprechaun, and he pointed under a tree. How am I going to get it? Well, you may run home and get a spade. I'm going to do something, and you have to make me a promise. You have to make me a promise that if I mark that tree with this red guard around my leg, you'll keep that ribbon on it. I promise, said the leprechaun. Now, are you sure? I promise, I promise, on the pot of gold. Right, said Michael. He set the wee man down and tied the ribbon round the tree, and off he ran for home as fast as he could through the village, into his own house, grabbed the spade, away he came back to the tree. And the sight that he saw when he reached that wood, he couldn't believe his eyes. Hadn't the wee devil tied a ribbon round every single tree in the wood? He'd never find out which one the pot of gold was under, unless he dug up the whole forest. Sure, all he could do was laugh. But it just goes to show, never trust a leprechaun. They're tricky boys. A little superstitious mischief never harmed anyone, we might think. But perhaps tales like these don't tell the full story. Perhaps the fairies have a darker side, too. All across Ireland, there are places which, for generations, have been linked with fairy magic. Lonely thorn trees, standing stones, ring forts, all haunted by the spirits of the she. Of course, it's just superstition. Like all ghost stories, there is really nothing to fear. Mind you, a certain fiddle player once thought this way and lived to regret it. Well, this was a great fiddler, and he was coming home from a big do. And uh, he could have gone round the road, but there was a shortcut across the fields, and he had to pass by a big fort. We called them forts, but in them days they were called rats. And when he came near the fort, here was the fairies dancing round on the rim of the fort. Come in, Paddy, come in, Paddy. We want you to play for us. We want to hear your music, and we want all to dance to your music. So Paddy was delighted, and in he went. And the first thing they gave him was some great drink, and he loved it. And on he went playing, and they kept dancing all round him. And it went on for a good while. And then they came, and they put gold in his pocket, along with giving him this lovely drink to drink. And uh, on it went like that for what Paddy thought was the night. And at last I said, well, we have enough of your music now, you can go home. So Paddy was delighted and went home with his two pockets filled with gold. And uh, when he got near the house, 
here was a young man standing at, at his own door. And he walked up from him and he says, what are you doing here? Oh, he says, what, what are you doing here, he says. You were gone this two years, he says, and I married your wife. And you have no business at all here. <laughs> so he put his two hands in his pocket and here they were filled with horse manure and no gold. It was horse manure. <laughs> Still, a pocket full of horse manure and a little stolen time seems harmless enough. If only it were so simple. Like thieves, it said, the fairy folk covet what we treasure most. Many believe they are harbingers of death in league with the grim reaper himself. Those who hear the cry of the banshee, it said, or the tap of her nails on the window pane in the dead of night, will soon know the true meaning of loss. Even the most innocent have reason to fear. According to some old tales, the fairies are stealers of children. In cradles where infants are put down for the night, they leave changelings, withered creatures who quickly waste away and die. As legend has it, the stolen child will never grow old. Instead, it will live forever young in a realm without time. This realm, like the fairies themselves, has always been a mystery. Its existence has never been proved, but strangest of all, it has never been disproved either. Fairy tales, let's face it, are little more than children's stories and harmless superstitions. Only the very young or the very foolish could believe in them. We are too sophisticated. We know better. We have nothing to fear. Or so we think. In Irish folklore, fairies are far removed from the cute, gossamer-winged creatures of children's fiction. Tradition describes them as shapeshifters, spirits that can appear in any form even that of humans. One old story tells of a County Antrim fisherman who falls in love with a mermaid. Refusing to believe she is one of the fairy folk, he sets out to possess her. And eventually a wise woman uh, can give him the advice that he needs. And he realizes that every evening this beautiful girl uh, unclips her tail and turns into a human for a certain amount of time as she sits by the sea singing. And so he steals the tail. And with the tail, he takes her power. And so she must follow him home. And in the course of time, this pair have two children. And uh, the children are out playing one day, and it's raining. And they rush into the barn to play, and they're th uh, throwing straw around. And they dig down through the straw in their game. And they come to this shiny, iridescent thing under some old, mouldy sh straw that hasn't been interrupted for years. And when the mother saw this beautiful, uh, shining, iridescent thing lying in among the straw, she realised it was her tail. And she sent her children back into the house, and she clipped the tail on, and she flung herself off the highest cliffs and sang her way back out to sea, very happy at last. But when her husband came home that night, he was devastated to realise that his bride had gone and he never saw her again. He was very, very unhappy. But at night, when the children were asleep, she would come back into the house and she would comb their hair and smile and sing to them because she was happy to be back reunited with her own people at last. A new version of an old fantasy, we might think. But according to local superstition, the mermaid story is more than just a tall tale. On Rathlin Island, where I heard that story, they'll say that the descendants of the mermaid uh, are still to be seen on the island. They can be identified, I'm told, by the fact that they have uh, webbed toes, you know, skin between their, their toes. Uh, and so the idea is that her, her children are still there, alive and well, on the island. Needless to say, only the bravest would go to Rathlin asking for proof. According to legend, fairies are elusive, crafty creatures who can disappear without a trace. This, of course, is convenient enough for the wee folk. After all, if they're invisible, who is to say they don't exist? 
Some, however, actually claim to have found proof. In the early 19th century, a West of Ireland cottier found what he believed to be an actual shoe lost by one of the fairy folk. Terrified of the bad luck that it might bring him, he passed it on. Strange as it might seem, it still exists. This is a shoe that was found first in 1834, and there are several strange things about it. First, you see that it shows signs of wear in the sole and heel. Um, secondly, it's been at some time mended rather clumsily. There are two heavy stitches in the back of the heel itself. At one time, it's had laces. Uh, you can just see the eyelet holes at the end there. Um, I've shown it to a cobbler. He tells me that it's as good work as any cobbler could do. Indeed, better because of its size, and you can see how small it is. I've also shown it to the curator of a doll's museum, and uh, she says that it's certainly not a doll's shoe. It's far too well made for that. It would be interesting to have the leather tested in a laboratory. I've not had this done, but in order to do it properly, you'd have to snip a bit off the shoe, and I think that would probably. Uh, the fairies mightn't like that, might they? We might take superstition like this with a pinch of salt. But the fairy folk have had worse things attributed to them than lost shoes. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Yeats's poem, The Stolen Child, has a bittersweet message. In the past, the legend of the changeling, the child stolen by the fairies, was never really meant to entertain. Often, it resonated with genuine tragedy. There were changeling traditions. Uh, if your baby wasn't doing particularly well, well, perhaps it had been changed. You know, it wasn't that the child was in some way um, handicapped or disadvantaged. Uh, the wee folk were to blame. They had substituted one of their own. Uh, women in childbirth were often taken away by the fairies. Again, maternal mortality being an extraordinarily uh, high, um, there's an extraordinarily high risk of mat maternal mortality here. And so fairies came to play, came to uh, interact directly in people's lives in this kind of way and could be blamed for all sorts of mishaps or things which might naturally go wrong, which were otherwise difficult to explain. At times when stillbirth Cot death and Down syndrome were not so easily explained. The changeling tradition may have comforted grieving parents. But by rights, medical science should have put an end to it a hundred years ago. Strangely, it didn't. Even today, there are those who remember ash being smeared on the faces of young children to ward off evil spirits. According to legend, the fairies were discerning meticulous thieves, and filthy youngsters were of no interest to them. Once customs like these were common, the little folk were spoken of in hushed voices. All kinds of places were said to be haunted by the spirits of the she. According to superstition, those who interfered or even ventured too close risked falling under their spell. Old wives' tales, we might think. But still, despite the passage of centuries, despite the preoccupations of the modern world, there are places where superstitions endure. And even those who say they don't believe will not destroy them, dig them up, or even till the soil nearby. Why? What could they possibly have to fear? In Ireland, the past lies undisturbed. All across the land, the monuments of ancient civilizations are still part of the landscape. Untouched for thousands of years, these monoliths, stone rings and dolmens have an otherworldly atmosphere, an aura of mystery which goes beyond what we know of them. It is hardly surprising that, at one time or another, most have taken their place in fairy lore. If the little people ever had a home, it was here in these stones.
Despite the superstition once attached to them, many so-called fairy forts have little to do with the occult. Most are raths, island homesteads which were common in Ireland right up to medieval times. Some, however, have a more ominous background. These are the tombs of our Stone and Bronze Age ancestors, ancient mausoleums where the dead were buried more than 4,000 years ago. With the arrival of the Celtic civilization, which came to Ireland during the first millennium BC, these old tombs took on a whole new importance. They knew that these tombs weren't part of the natural landscape. They knew that some peoples somehow had built them. But these were mysterious peoples of the past. So that they situated their continental Celtic gods in these tombs in Ireland, in these old rats in the landscape. And also the Celts had a belief that when one dies, one doesn't just disappear, that one lives on in another world beside this world. So that within these ancient tombs and within these ancient artifacts in the landscape, they believed that the other world people lived on. Even with the coming of Christianity in the 5th century, belief in this mysterious world of the dead survived. Gradually, as paganism disappeared, the tombs became symbolic repositories for every god and goddess, every banished demon and lost soul of Ireland's heathen past. Despite the disapproval of the church, the beliefs attached to them, however, lingered on. Right up to the last century, for example, Iron tongs were often laid across the tops of cradles. The custom seems bizarre now, but once iron was considered a powerful talisman. The ancient Irish believed it could ward off evil spirits. And so, centuries later, iron tongs, like iron horseshoes, became good luck charms. Strangely, even now, in a time when they have become totally irrational, similar taboos survive. Even those who claim to know better wouldn't dare put them to the test. Well, fairies, in a sense, are spirits, uh, but um, whether they exist or not, uh, I don't personally believe in them, but belief is a matter of emotion as well as of rationale, and uh, I wouldn't interfere with a fairy fort. That is an old earthenwork fort in the landscape. Um, we, are, we are told that if you dig up one of these forts, or if you cut down a fairy tree, a tree standing all alone in the landscape, if you cut that down, some bad luck will befall you. So that um, even though rationally I wouldn't believe in them, I wouldn't like to interfere with these places nevertheless. Even when fairy forts occupied valuable land, which could be used for farming, roads, homes, they were never disturbed. And there are many who are still convinced of their magical power. I know a man, I went to school with him in fact, and he would swear that he saw a leprechaun seated on the edge of a fort one morning, shaving himself. And no matter how hard he was questioned, he still uh, persisted in the belief that he did see a leprechaun in the vicinity of the fort. So, you know, that belief was very, very strong that they were the abodes of fairies, hence the name, Fairy Fort. In the modern world, the superstition which once surrounded the fairy folk has faded. But as strange as it may seem, a great many people still believe. Why? Is it simply that old habits die hard, or could there really be more to the legends than we think? Even if we are tempted to dismiss the fairies as harmless superstition, one fact remains. 
They are still part of our vocabulary. Is it simply force of habit? Or is there something else at work? So even if people are uh, inclined to say, oh, I don't believe in fairies, they're still very aware of the power of the fairies. And so they function in all kinds of ways. They, they can uh, directly or indirectly actually govern people's behavior. And on a more symbolic level, uh, they reflect the fact that there are great uh, environmental and supernatural forces which play upon people's uh, realizations in all kinds of ways that perhaps they don't always account for. In the past, people's behavior was governed in more earthly ways too. And certain fairy tales had very little to do with magic. A malingering worker, for instance, a cheating husband or wife, even an occasional drunk could always blame their disappearances on the fairies. They had not simply gone missing. They had been lost in a fairy field or kidnapped by the wee folk. For those with enough nerve, the little people provided a last ditch alibi. These days, such fairy tales are rare. The church, some claim, has long since banished the superstitions and heathen beliefs which gave them credibility. There's no fairies now. Not for 30 years. They don't exist today. For the last 30 years, there's so many masses said for the suffering souls. Uh, this is my idea, and it was backed up by priests too, that there's so many masses said for the suffering souls that there's no such thing as fairies at all now. Are no ghosts either. No fairies are ghosts this last 30 years. And yet, 30 years ago, exactly the same thing was said. And 30 years before that. No doubt, 30 years from now, it will be said again. Even the legends, it seems, are elusive. Fairies, you see, are never connected with the present, always with the past. Surprisingly, even the famous leprechaun is a latecomer to fairy lore. Like the mermaid, the mischievous elf-like figure was only introduced to Ireland during medieval times. Sadly, the king of the fairies was never more than a colourful imposter. Fairies are largely superstition now, but there has to be some basis. In fact, furthermore, wouldn't have survived for this long, and especially since um, the church had such a, an influence on the lives of people back 50, 60, 100 years ago. Why would religious people still do these things and tribute to fairies? They're going against the church's teaching as such. It's possible that the little people do exist. I wouldn't like to test it out by insulting them. But what of the fairies' most intriguing legend, the elusive crock of gold? It's just a myth, of course. Or is it? During the 19th century, a County Limerick farmer risked a lifetime of bad luck by planting rows of potatoes in a fairy fort on his land. Later, as he tilled the soil, he unearthed a goblet of solid gold encrusted with jewels. It was the Arda Chalice, a priceless piece of 9th century church art which had been wisely hidden in the fort to protect it from theft. For 10 centuries, the sheer weight of people's superstition kept it safe. Since then, things have certainly changed. The original fairy fort is all but destroyed now, but the chalice, one of Ireland's most valuable relics, has a place of honor in the National Museum. Perhaps, as many say, belief in the little folk was never anything more than a fantasy. Perhaps it has more to do with human fears and emotions than any supernatural realm. But remember, every fairy tale has a twist in it. The less we believe, 
the more we have to fear. And there's one final legend of the Isles to be explored. 